this morning we're looking at overcoming personal need. Now everyone in here has a personal need. And there's times you've had personal needs and more personal needs and no question about it. You may even now. And the thing we have to be honest with ourselves with is to really evaluate it and take a very close and in-depth look at it and to make sure that it's a need and not a want or desire. Because we're full of that. We have many desires and wants and gimmies and more and, and, and so forth. And we have to get to a place where we really determine, is this a real, genuine, bona fide need? And can we overcome that personal need? And you go, wait a minute, I don't want to overcome it. I want it. Well, hang in here with me. We're going to take a look at this and see how we do that. Okay, and how God will take care of it and meet that. So let's take a read and see how uh, Elisha comes on the scene after the prophet Elijah. All right, so follow along with me if you would please. In 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse number 9 through 12, we see here, and it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them into two pieces. And of course, you know, he picked up the mantle, went back across the river, and began his ministry. And not long into his ministry, he comes to this passage where we're at today. Chapter 4, verse number 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen, slaves. And Elisha said unto her, Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. In other words, get all you can get. And when thou art come in, Thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all those vessels. And thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, and she shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Praise the Lord. Obviously, we see the desperation of this woman. No doubt she's in a time and place in her life now. She had a provider. She had a husband who worked and provided for her and her family, and now he's dead. He's gone, and she's now become a Genuine, bona fide widow in need. And she has a personal need. And no doubt she's in desperation because uh, we see her desperation of this woman because the fact, number one, because her husband is dead. Now that's a big thing back in those days. It is even today. Those of you that have lost your husbands and, 
and, and so forth, and, and wives, and, and maybe the provider of your home, and, and the one that is the breadwinner of the house is, is gone, and now you're wondering how are we going to make it, and how are we going to make ends meet, and how are we going to work things out, and, and, uh, you know, and where is the income going to come from, and where is the supplies are going to come from, and, and you begin thinking, I have so many needs uh, that I feel that, that, that I have, and that are going to need to be met, and, and, and I don't know where they're going to come from, and I don't know how they're going to come, and so you do as this poor this this dear woman does in desperation you cry out the bible said she cried so no doubt she probably had been been sharing this with neighbors and others of her of her situation that she had and 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 now what will i do what am i going to do and and she cries in in absolute agony and and that may be where you're at today and those of you that are watching and listening today perhaps maybe you have a real desperate a need a personal need and 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 you're wondering uh, who's going to meet it and how is it going to be met and and we've seen already just this past week uh, we've we've read of cases and stories of of many that have lost their lives uh, in accidents even here in our own county from from children to adults and and families now that are grieving and in great sorrow and and even the some that are in uh, surgeries and hospitals and and so forth and 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 they're they're sort of and this is the christmas season and and you know what what are we going to do and what am i going to do in the future and how am i going to be able to do this and meet this and so you cry out in in pain and agony and suffering uh, for help and that's what she's doing She's crying and she's pleading for help in, in her desperation that, look, and now there cried a certain woman. And so we see her cry here of desperation. And, and she says, she, she tells uh, that the, the servant, she says, my husband is dead. Now that's a pretty personal need. You know, what am I going to do? I'm a widow. I have sons. Scripture doesn't tell us how old they are or their age. But it does tell us that the bondsmen, the creditors, are coming after her. The creditors are coming after her. Some of the creditors may be coming after you. Now, some of you, the creditors are going to be coming after you in January. Because you have a thing in your pocket called plastic. And you're going to go out and get yourself in debt. And you're going to become a slave to the master. And then you're going to worry how in the world you're going to pay for it come January. And there you've charged up a thousand or more or more, and, and that's already on top of the other four or five thousand you got. And you're paying 14, 15, high 19, 23 percent interest, which will take you the rest of your life to pay it off on the minimum. And the thing is, the minimum, you never pay it off because you keep adding to it. And then when that card's filled, you go get another one. And you get another one. Now, if you got a personal need to that, that's your fault. Okay, you're being a poor manager and steward of your finances. I'm telling you, you need to have a different look at that and, and reconsider what's going on there. If you don't have the cash, don't buy it. See, don't spend money you don't have. You see, don't spend money you haven't even earned yet. You say, well, I'm going to get a big promotion. Maybe. I got a new increase coming, and, and, and so maybe. May not. You might get sick and find yourself in the hospital. And then who's going to pay for all these bills? Just telling you, be careful. Keep your cards in your pocket. And if you got some that are close to full, hide them in the drawer and forget you have them. Don't use them. Don't go out and get new ones. My goodness. Hang in here with us, all right? Much to learn. I mean, this lady, dear lady, she cries out in absolute awareness of what's going on around her because notice she tells them that in this passage here. She said, my servant is dead. And, and, and she says, thou knowest uh, that thy servant d uh, uh, did fear the Lord. It's interesting how she's telling uh, the prophet uh, that you know, prophet, that my husband feared the Lord. It's interesting how Elisha would know that. 
Perhaps maybe he'd been there before. Maybe he had met her before. Maybe he was aware of the situation. I don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But she's aware of the fact what has happened around her that the husband has died. I have two sons to care for. I don't have anything. But, uh, but prophet uh, Elisha, you are aware that, hey, listen, my husband served the Lord. That fear there is the word that's used for an awe, uh, an awe of reverence. You know, my husband I had a reverence for the Lord, and, and, and I need some help. I, I got a need. And I'm thankful she went to the right person. So many times people seek counsel, and they, they go to the wrong counsel. They go to the world for counsel. They go to the entertainment for counsel. And, and they take the advice of a, of. of stars and, and, and so forth and, and, and the world. And no, you ought to go to the man of God and to the word of God. That's why God gives you a shepherd and a pastor to, that spends hours and hours upon weeks and weeks of, of prayer and, and studying to know the word of God so that he can be there uh, to help you and, and during this time and so forth. But she cried out in awareness. See, here this woman was in, in a desperate situation, but now it was God's opportunity to do something. And so she was crying out to the man of God, the prophet of God, Elisha, who represents God, because that's who they were in Israel's time during that time. They were God's representative. They were God's spokesman. And the people were always going, the Hebrew people were always going to the prophet and telling us, tell us, what does the Lord say? Because they always were counting on the prophet to go to God and talk to God and get the answer and so forth. And, and, And then they would come back and say, now tell us, what does the Lord say? And sometimes they would listen and sometimes they wouldn't. But perhaps maybe you're aware of, of what's going on and what's happening in, in this time in your life or this crisis or this time of personal need that you have and you're crying out. Well, just make sure you cry out unto the Lord. Amen. Don't cry out into the world and the world's philosophy and the world's thinking and the world's uh, uh, and so forth. No, my friend, uh, there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel, but you've got to have godly counsel Amen. for that. And, and you ought to cry out unto the Lord. You ought to cry out unto the, to God's men and women uh, that are close to the Lord that can help you and cry out unto the Word of God and get your directions and instructions from the Word of God. But she was definitely in, in her cry. She cries out in this total awareness of what's going on. Hey, my husband's dead. The creditors are coming to my house. They're going to take my sons, take them into slavery to pay the debt. What am I going to do? Perhaps some of you are in that situation. You know, some of you out there are watching and listening. I love you to death, man. appreciate you. But you're still in debt from last Christmas. And all year long. Stop spending. Stop charging. You want something bad. And most everything that you've charged is not a need. Hello, come on, talk to me. Thank you, sister. Amen. Most of the stuff of why you're in debt today is not because you have a need, it's you have a want and a desire. And you want it and give it to me, I can get it, and I want it, and give me, give me, give me, my, mine, mine. And, you know, and, and, and the, you know, the story goes on and on. And then next thing you know, the creditors are knocking on your door. Now they don't knock anymore. They don't even send you mail anymore. It's in your email and your text and on your phone. They got your number. And they tell you, we're coming after you. Huh? Some of you know, some of you may have been there. Been there, done that, you know, and, and you've, hopefully you've learned from that. Amen? So she cries out here in awareness, and, and look at her cry, the awareness. She says, Lotus, she says, the creditor has come. I mean, it's not that he's on his way. He's come. And so now the creditor's there to collect the debt, and she has nothing but a, a pot of oil? Well, the creditors don't want that. So in Hebrew time, in the Old Testament time, they were allowed to take the sons and turn them into slaves and work them until the debt was paid for. Well, then that's really going to leave her totally destitute and all alone because now it'll be just her and nothing and nothing in the house. I mean, when she said she had nothing, I mean, my goodness, maybe she didn't even have any furniture because I know what? I've seen the creditors come to the neighbor's door and take the furniture. You know, you don't pay for it, they come and get it. Now, it's nice to have all these vibrating chairs and, and recliners and, and all this stuff and, 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 and 120-inch TVs and, you know, and all that kind of stuff, but you got to pay for it. And you say, well, I got a good job. Well, you might today, but not tomorrow. You see? And so this dear woman in, in total 
desperation and destitute. She cries and, 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 and she's, she's, she's aware of her awareness around her. The creditors are knocking at the door and she tells the man of God, I have an immediate need. Now you might have an immediate need today. And I don't know what it is. Now I want to tell you something. Listen to me. If you're lost without Christ and you don't know the Savior today, I want to tell you something. You not only have a personal need for a Savior, you have an immediate need. Because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You don't know what the day may bring. You don't know if you have breath for the next breath you take without God's permission. And so you have immediate need. And I would encourage you and challenge you if you're lost without Jesus and you don't know the Savior uh, and you have a personal need for the Savior because you can't save yourself and only Jesus can forgive you of your sins and wash you and cleanse you in, in His blood. My friends, so you have a immediate need for forgiveness, immediate need for cleansing, immediate need for, for heaven. You have immediate need for the Savior. So don't put it off because, my friend, you too are in debt and you are a slave to the world and to sin and you need a Savior. Simple as that. And so she's in a personal crisis and some of you are in a personal crisis today. I hope this is going to help some people, especially as we enter into Christmas season. Because it's so easy now to buy anything. You don't got to go out of your house. You can go on the internet, and you can go to Amazon. The blue truck's cruising in your neighborhood, and all you got to do is pick it out and punch in some numbers, and hopefully that that card is still working, and that it has enough credit left on it to get what you want. Hello. And sooner or later, it shows up at your house, hopefully. Depends on where you live. You live out, some of our folks around here that live out in the, in the woods, uh, it may show up at the neighbor's house or down the road at somebody else's house, okay? <laughs> so, hey, th- she had a personal crisis. A look at this by Adam Clark says this. Children, according to the laws of the Hebrews, were considered the property of their parents who had the right to dispose of them for the payment of their debts. So she's in immediate crisis. No, you, you can't take my son's. So we have this poor dear woman, and perhaps maybe that's where you're at today. If you're saved and you know the Lord, you have a personal need. I don't know what that need is. You need to examine your heart and take a close look. Is this a real, genuine, bona fide need, or is this just something I want, or desire, or think I need? You know, need to make sure that it's a real need. And then I would encourage you to call out unto godly people and godly wisdom for help that love you and care for you and and find the answers from God's word. And uh, especially, and if things are about to happen, obviously she's in dire need of something taking place like right now. But let's see what happens. I want you to see the desire of the prophet the desire of the prophet. In verse 2, we see the desire here of the prophet who happens to be a reflection of the heart of God and the mind of God because he is the man of God. He's God's spokesman. He's God's representative in that time. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. So we see the desire of the prophet and notice what the prophet says to her. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? So obviously he's willing to do something for her. And he wants to see from her heart what it is. Now remember, he represents the heart and mind of God as the prophet of God. See, God wants to see our heart. God wants to know what our motive is, what our attitude is, because he sees all that. And so we find here, he goes, well, what shall I do for thee? It's interesting, that's the same thing that Elijah said to him. What shall I do for you? And Elisha went on to tell him. All right. What shall I do for thee? He says there in verse 2. Tell me. Come on, tell me, dear sweet lady. What has thou? He asked her a question. What do you have in your house? Do you remember another time when God talked to one of his men? By the name of Moses? 
Moses, what's in your hand? See, God wants us to do something. What do you have, dear woman? What do you have that God can use? What do you have that God can make something of this for you? You see. So he asked her, what do you have in your house? And she answered, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Well, God can use a pot of oil. Hello. The desire of the prophet here, what shall I do for thee? Listen to this. Now, the prophet's facing now a widow indeed. James 1.27 says this. Our brother James writes, half-brother of our Lord. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And to keep thy himself unspotted from the world. You want to know what pure religion is? is to visit the orphans, the fatherless, and the widows. The widows in their affliction. And to keep yourself unspotted from the world. See, it's not programs. It's not all the entertainment and activity. We have several widows in our church. We have some that were here that are not here. We still have some with us. We're instructed here. And those widows sometimes come to the pastor, or they come to the deacons, they come to the church even, and say, I have a need. Okay? Now she had a need, and the prophet knew that. But he wanted to... You might say he could wanted to test her. Well, what do you have? What do you have, dear woman, that could help meet this need? Or what do you have that we could use to help meet the need? Doesn't matter how big it is or how small it is or what it is. Do you have something? Moses, what do you got in your hand? It's a stick. Throw it down. Right. Throw it down. Okay. Cobra. Whoa! If I'd have been Moses, I'd have been walking on water. I could just see God. What do you think about that, Moses? That's pretty good, God. Here I got a better one for you. Pick it up by the tail. Oh, well, no, wait a minute now. We're going a little too far. I don't mind throwing a stick down on the ground. But now you want me to pick up that cobra by the tail. You don't pick up snakes by the tail. Pick it up. Aye, right, Captain. He picked it up. Came a stick. Wow. I don't know if Moses thought that was a pretty good trick or what. <laughs> Wasn't there. But he was beginning to see, you see, that God could work through him with whatever, how little it was. It was just a stick. But it became something powerful and mighty in the hand of God. You see, you got a need today. What's in your hand? What's in your house? that you can give to God, that God can take and use it to help you. See, God wants to help. He's there. But I think sometimes He likes for us to kind of help ourselves, you know. We have this old saying that the world says, you know, God helps them who helps themselves. Now, we don't find that writing in the Scripture, okay. But we have the principle there. Okay, because, you know, she had something. It may be little, it may be nothing. But then to her, it may have been everything because she said, this is all I've got. And I remember another dear woman that gave and it was time for giving of the collection of the plate and all the big wigs came by and all the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers and the religious people and the rich people and they put in tons of money and here comes this poor little widow. This is poor as dirt and puts in two little mites about a half of a penny. And Jesus said, she gave all that she had. And she's a testimony in the word of God today for us. What's in your house? Some of you got a lot of stuff in your house. Some of you got a lot of stuff in your shed. Some of you have bought two sheds. Now you got a third one, and you're building a bigger one. What's in your barn? 
Oh, the preacher's gone to meddling. No, what do you got? The man of God says, what do you want me to do for you? So what do you've got there, lady? You see, because this, the man of God, is a reflection of the heart of God. See, this reflects the heart of God if God wants to do something for you. God wants to do something for me. God wants to meet your need. God wants to meet my need. Whatever that may be. And it reflects the heart of God when we come to God and say, Lord, I have a need. And, and here's my awareness and here's my situation. And, and, and she, we could say the same thing that there's, there's, this dear lady says. I know you know it. God knows everything, right? So he's already aware of it. Okay? So he's just wanting us to put a foot forth here. Put forth a little effort. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. See, when you got a personal need and it's real, you need to go to the Lord. Now, yes, God puts brothers and sisters in our pathway and godly people in our pathway to help us and to give us counsel. And from the Word of God, uh, this man called me the other day from Alberta, Canada. And he was watching a message we preached back in February of 2014 on the internet of crossing God's deadline. And it was haunting him. And he said, man, I need some help on this. I need to know if I've crossed that or what I had to do to cross it or what, what, you know, he went on and on and 45 minutes later and, and God was just bringing scripture after scripture to my mind of memory of quoting that I didn't even know where it was at or had anything to do with it. But it was the spirit of God and, and, and to, to try to help this young man out or old man, I don't know, he sounded like a younger man, but you know, I didn't ask him his age, but you know, uh, he was, and I, I stressed, I kept stressing more. He said he was saved and knew the Lord and so forth, so we tried to work in that angle, but then he kept coming on more about this and that and, and, and doubting his salvation and sin and so forth. So I changed the whole thing around and said, are you saved? Do you know the Lord? Have you been born again? Amen. See, we need to make sure of that first, sir. That's the only thing I can help you with right off the bat is you gotta make sure you're saved and you know the Lord and, and then you gotta trust him and believe in him and put all your trust and faith in him that God will take care of this and this problem and so forth and so on as we went on through it. You see, he sought out counsel from a preacher that he heard seven years ago. Praise God. Reflects the heart of God. Listen to Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let your conversation, that's your manner of living, your lifestyle, be without covetousness. Don't covet. Don't get in debt. And be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do to me. God is your helper no matter who's knocking on your door. You don't need to worry about what man may do to you or what our fear, okay, shall do unto you. Because why? The Lord is your helper. And you may walk through that valley of shadow of death and that personal need that you have, it's, in, it's immediate, it's, it's uh, devastating to you. I want to assure you that God will never leave you nor forsake you. He will walk through it with you. He will go through it with you. And He will supply your need because He said He promised He would supply our need. According to His riches in Christ Jesus in glory. Not your wants or your desires, but your need. So this, this reflects the provision of God, uh, this desire of the prophet. He wants to know, what should I do for you? He, he's speaking on behalf of God. Is what can God do for you? Really is what he was saying to her. What do you want God to do for you? God has a heart to want to take care of you and to help you. Okay, and you can come to his boldly and ask for the time of help and the time of need. And it reflects the provision of God. Philippians 4.19 says, but my God, say that with me, but my God, is he your God today? Do you know him today? So you can't stand here and say, well, he's somebody else's God. He's her God. He's his God. No, is he your God? Do you know him personally? I'm not talking about you know about him and you know of him, but do you know him? To whom to know is life everlasting. Do you know the God of heaven and the God of glory? 
you see. But if you do, my friend, then you can say without a shadow of a doubt, with all the confidence in the world, I have a personal need, but I know my God shall supply my need. You see, and he will. And even sometimes he'll even provide your desires and wants if they're in accordance with his will. And he thinks it's good for you and you won't worship it. You won't put it before him. And that you'll glorify him in and through it. He gives us the desires of our hearts, but the desires of our heart ought to be His desires. And the only way you're going to know His desires is to get in the book. You see, and when you have the desires in the mind of Christ, He don't mind doing for you and giving it to you and whatever else. The Bible says He will withhold no good thing to them that walk uprightly. See, there's the key. You've got to be walking uprightly. You've got to be living and acting righteously, and God will withhold no good thing. Now, see, you and I, in our mind, and thinking, we think, well, oh, that's a good thing. But God may say, no, that's not a good thing. See, then we get a little bit upset and upset because we didn't get it or we didn't come through and so forth because, see, God knows what's best for you and I. He sees the big picture. He knows what's down the road. He knows what's around the bend. And he would say, no, this is, this is not a good thing for you. And you say, well, but God, I'm walking up rightly. I'm living righteously. I'm acting righteously. I'm doing righteously. I don't understand it. This is not a good thing for you. How much more clear do I need to make myself? Trust me. Because I know what's best for you. Oh, praise the Lord. So God provides. So he asked her, you know, he says, what do you want me to do for you? He says, all right, what's in your house? All right, and see, 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 the prophet was determined here to, to get her to respond and to get her involved in this. He was determined. Exodus 4, 2 says, And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. What's in your house, dear woman? All I've got is a saved pot of oil. Okay. Well, let's look at some other illustrations here in the Scripture. In John chapter 6 and verse 5, you remember when Jesus lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him and said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? All right, we got a personal need here. We're facing a dilemma here, man. We got a lot of people here that are hungry and need something to eat. What are we going to do? Peter, what are we going to do? Philip, what are we going to do? You got some money? Go buy bread. You know, do something. And Philip answers in verse 9. He said, there's a lad here. And see, see, the first uh, illustration we see here is we see a lad. Say that with me, a lad. The lad here, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? I want to tell you something, little is much in the hand of God. A pot of oil turns into gallons of oil. See, God was not only going to meet her need, he was going to give her over and above and beyond so she could sell it and have an income to help support her and her sons and still have left over. Elijah, Elijah experienced the same thing with the widow, you remember? She said, I've got just enough oil to make a cupcake, a little cake, and my son and I are going to eat it and we're going to die. And Elijah experienced the same thing with the oil. And it never ran dry. You see, 611. And Jesus took the loaves, you see. And we see, first of all, what do you got? What do we got, Philip? Well, we got a little boy here that's got a few loaves and fishies. I right, give it to me. What's in your hand, Philip? Now give it and put it in my hand. And Jesus began to pray over it. He gave thanks and he distributed it to the disciples. And the disciples then that were set down. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And you know the story. They ended up with baskets left over. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 41 through 44. And Jesus said over against the treasury. So see, first of all, we see the lad. Here's another illustration here. And, and Jesus against the treasury. And beheld uh, the cast of money into the treasury. Here we're going to see a widow's might. And many of the rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow. And she threw in two mites, which uh, made a farthing. And he called unto his disciples and said unto them, Verily, I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. All of them put together. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. What's in your house today, church? that God wants to use 
to help meet your need, to supply your need, to bring Him glory, to bring Him honor, to see somebody saved. What's in your house? What's in your bank account? What's in your treasury? What's buried in your yard? So here we go. So we see these wonderful stories. We, we, we see this crowd that, that it's hungry. Uh, and we see this lad. Then we see this widow. I mean, it's fantastic. Then we see the deploy. Oh, look at the deploy here. You see, God is going to, uh, the, what's in the house, uh, there's the determination here. What's determined? What's determined? What do we got? We got a, a pot of oil. That's what we got. All right, let's deploy it. 2 Corinthians 8, 10, and 12. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Paul's talking about the church of Corinth that had made a, a faith promise giving to missions a year ago, but they hadn't come through with it yet. Okay? Now, therefore, say what? Now, present tense, therefore, because of what the pledge you made a year ago, see, therefore, because of that pledge that you made, now, present tense, now, therefore, perform, see, deploy it, do the doing of it. That is, there was a readiness to will. You had the readiness a year ago to do it, so there may be a performance also out of which you have. You got to do it. You got to put it to work. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, not according to what he hath not. God wants you to do and perform with what you got. What do you got? I got a pot of oil. I got a stick in my hand. I got the three little loaves of fishies here and two biscuits. I got half, a half a penny. Amen. What do you got? You see, God wants to meet your need. And it may be personal, and I don't know how personal, I don't know how devastating it may mean it me. I don't know how urgent it is. God wants to meet it, but He expects something from you and I. And in all of this, we're going to see faith and obedience. That's where it all boils down to. So let's look at thirdly and lastly this morning, the deliverance of the family. Now you see, we've seen the widow, and we've seen her plight. We've seen the man of God and his response as he represents God and what? Now we're going to see the deliverance of the family. How many of you want deliverance today? See, how many of you want deliverance? How many of you want your personal need met? How many of you want to be delivered out of the mess you've made? Because we've all made some pretty good messes, haven't we? And boy, hasn't it been a relief when God has delivered us from it? Let's look at the deliverance of the family here. We find that in the verses here we've been reading. But let me bring your attention to Proverbs eleven twenty four. There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. So you want to hold on and hold on to it and hoard it, it's going to turn to poverty. That's what King Solomon says here. But if you take what you have and you scatter it, it increases. You see, the stick became a powerful tool in the hand of God. It wasn't the hand of Moses. Okay? The bread and the fishies fed 5,000 people, but it wasn't in the kid's hand. It was in Jesus' hand. You see. What's in your hand? What's in your house? It can be sweet deliverance. Share with what you have. Give what you have, and it shall be pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give to your bosom. Giving is not a matter of can and can't, but it's a matter of will or won't. Whoever said that, thank you, sister. Let me read it again. Giving is not a matter of can and can't, but a will or won't. So what did she have for this deliverance? She had a pot of oil. You see, when it comes to stewardship, God provides the raw materials and then tells us to do something with it. Amen. You see, this is what the prophet was trying to get across. She had a need. She didn't realize or know what she had in her house was something that God could take and use to meet the need. But she had to be willing to give that need and recognize it. All right, prophet of God, this is all I got. I got a pot of oil. That's what you want. That's it. You know, whatever, whatever. And she was willing to do that. She had a pot of oil. What do you have? What do you got? That God can take and use and multiply, that you can share and give and be a blessing to those around us. Stewardship. It takes finances to run this church. 
and to run the ministries of this church. You want television, you want radio, you want internet, you want YouTube, you want iPhone, you know, you want Rumble, you want Sky, uh, uh, Facebook, you want uh, all the stuff that goes with it and, every, and all of that part of it. You want a mail out DVD ministry that that back there at the table is full of stuff for you. And I see one of our ladies going out here every week with five or six of them. And I know what she's doing. She's giving them out. She's mailing them out. It's a ministry of hers to do that. And we have others and people calling in and writing in and seeking in one of these things. Well, all that takes money. It takes finances. You see, God's given us the tools to do it. And He's given us people that are willing to do it. But then we need people that are willing to give to it so that we can use the tools that God has given us and that the people that want to do it. It's all part of stewardship. There had to be the presentation of faith. You see, she had to have faith. Okay, I'm going to trust the man of God as a representation of God. This is what I got. I'm going to give him the oil. I'm going to trust him. Faith. Where's your faith today? Where's your faith today? Amen? Amen. All right. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In other words, it's certain of God's power. It's certain of God's provision. It's certain of His promises. Then there has to be the presentation of sacrifice. See, whatever you got, you got to trust God with it. You've got to have faith that God will take it and use it and multiply it for His glory. No matter how little, how big, or how small it is, trust God with it. Well, you've got a need, okay? So what do you have that God can use to help meet that need today in your life? Those of you that have a need for the Savior, God has provided. He's provided a great salvation that is free to all and whosoever will may come. And whosoever will shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For if you're willing to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. God's provided it. For by grace are you going to be saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, God's even going to give you, if you have a desire to know the Savior today, because you have a personal need, because you have an immediate problem, and the creditors are knocking at your door, who is the devil, who wants to take you to hell, but God has made a provision to take you to heaven. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you're just willing to trust Him and come to Him, put your faith and trust in Him. There has to be a presentation of sacrifice. Sometimes we have to sacrifice what we have in order for God to meet the need. She had a need and she was willing to sacrifice the oil. All vision that is not worthy of sacrifice is not a Christ-like vision. You've got to have a sacrificial vision. 2 Samuel 24, 24 says this, And the king said, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doeth cost, that doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Sometimes we have to make a sacrifice. Oh, we have to give a sacrifice. She was willing to sacrifice it all. The woman in the story in Elijah, in Elijah with her, she was willing to sacrifice the little oil she had left to make a cake, a cupcake. And it was going to die. So the prophet of God went to work. And turned it into a river flowing of oil. Oh, you see, why not? Why not? There's no limit to God's supply. There's no running dry. There's no running short. Heaven's not short. God's supply office and warehouse is not short. God's not broke. Even though we may be next year. But God's not broke. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the gold in the mines, the silver in the mines, the copper in the mines, the ore in the mines. God owns it all. The planet's His. It's all His. If I'm that hungry, he'll send the vultures by my house to drop off some raw meat. Now, here's the problem with some. Oh, I got a need. God, I'm starving. I'm hungry. I don't have nothing to eat. Okay. Raven number one. Go get that squirrel that just got run over. All right, go to such and such address. Okay, you got sonar. All right, drop it on the front porch. Ring the doorbell, too. You walk out of the door, 
Bless my soul. Look at here. We got us a fresh roadkill. Squirrel. Now the squirrel will sit there for eternity if you don't take a step forward and pick it up and clean it and gut it and throw it in the pan and cook it and eat it. See, God provided his part. You got to do your part. So how many times does God do that for us? And then we don't do nothing. Well, good luck, Lord. I mean, you could have at least cooked it, couldn't you? You could have brought over a barbecue squirrel. Instead, you give me raw squirrel to eat. God probably sits and says, can't never satisfy him, can I? The angels all probably say, yeah, you're right, God. It's unbelievable. And what you do for them, and you still can't satisfy them. Now they're crying because the thing's not cooked. And if you cooked it, they probably say, well, you didn't cook it just right. I like it medium rare. Or I want it like a so-and-so that likes it black. Like the shoe leather on your foot. See, it wouldn't matter how God prepared it, you wouldn't be happy or satisfied. I know it. Amen. Well, you see, not only was there the sacrifice that she made, not only was there a faith, the presentation of faith, there was the presentation of her sacrifice, but she obeyed the word of God. She obeyed the word. See, you have to make preparations. When it comes to the scripture, Ephesians 3, 20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly above and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worked within us. you got to make some provisions. You see, there's got to be some provisions. you got to need, but you need to do something. You need to act on your part and act on faith, and, and you need to sacrifice if necessary. And, and then you need to make provisions. You need to prepare. Get it ready. You see what the Lord would have probably had you done, all right? You really want to step out on faith. Go get the oil. Put it in the pan. Get the pan hot on the, on the coals outside, and then pray for God to drop the squirrel in the pan for you. Yeah. Amen? And he probably would because you prepared. Yeah. See, but if you don't prepare... How's God sometimes going to meet our needs when we've made no pre preparation for it? It's not that it is that He want to and that He won't. Hebrews eleven six. 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. If you're going to come to God today, in faith, you must believe that He is God and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That's faith. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it also says, but without faith it's impossible to please God. Paul said in Romans 14, 23, that anything that's not done in faith is sin. So she had to prepare. How did she prepare? She told her sons, you go to the neighbors, you go to every door, you knock on the door, and you get all their empty vessels. She was preparing. So you got to prepare for rain sometimes, folks. The farmer has to prepare for rain. He's got to till and disc the land and row it and to get it and everything and to seed it and get it ready. Then he says, okay, God, send the rain. I've prepared. What good would it do if God sent the rain and the field wasn't prepared? It'd wash out. Son, go get all the vessels, all you can get. Then fill the vessels. See, what good would it have done if the boys would have brought all the vessels back, CJ, to the house, and there they sat on the shelf? And there they are. They're all out there on the table. The boys went to give. Now what are we going to do? Well, we're just going to sit here and wait for something to happen. Fill the vessels. Well, what am I going to fill them with, Mama? You only got one pot of oil, and you want us to fill all these vessels? Yeah, you get ready to watch God move and work. Because God's about to do the miraculous. God's about to do the impossible. Just waiting. Just waiting on you and I. While there was a vessel to fill... There was oil sufficient, and it only ceased to flow when there was no more vessels. Can you imagine that? Jeremiah 32, 7, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Amen. Nothing. Nothing. Even to fill oil. Even a one oil to make a more cakes to survive a widow and her son. Now a widow and two sons. Even enough left over to go sell and make a profit. She was worried about where the income's going to come from. 
God's going to take care of it. And lastly, she delivers her sons. She delivers her sons. How did she do it? She paid the debt which what God supplied. See, he supplied her need. She had an immediate problem. Her husband had died. She had no money. She had nothing. The creditors were at the door ready to take her sons and everything. She's in a desperate need, and God is wanting to do something. So she went to the man of God, asked the man of God what could to do. I, I need help. He says, what do you got? She tells him what he's got. Okay, let's get ready then. Let's make preparation. Go get the vessels. Bring them in. God's about to do something fantastic. Sometimes we're not even ready for the miracle. We're not ready for it. We don't prepare for it. We don't do anything. But oh, we want God to do something. Oh, she delivers her sons. Well, how she paid the debt. And not only that, you remember what the Bible says? Give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom? She had provisions left over to live on. You see, God not only provided the, the immediate need, but He provided the need from here on out. Oh, you see, she lived with her and her sons on the provision that God provided. Now, my friend, if you're here today without Christ, you can live on the provision that God has provided. And that is His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have life and have it more abundantly. You can have eternal life, everlasting life. You can have a life with meaning and purpose. You can have a life of joy and full of glory and unspeakable. Friend, if you're willing to take what you have and you say, well, what do I have? Your life. Give your life to Christ today. And then let Him turn and give you eternal life everlasting life because if you lose your life you'll find it oh you see my friend and those of you that are saved and know the Lord I know that you got pro I know you got needs and I know they're personal but you've got to be obedient you got to exercise your faith and be obedient to the scriptures and watch God do the miraculous If you're here without Christ today and watching and you not know the Savior, again, you have the greatest need of all of us here together, put together. And that is a need for the Savior. You cannot save yourself. You cannot forgive yourself of your sins and wash them and cleanse them. Only Jesus can do that and His precious blood. He died for you. He was born. He lived. He died. He was buried. And he rose again. And he ascended back to glory. And he offers you today eternal life, everlasting life. God has made a way. God has provided to meet your personal need of a Savior. And you say, well, I don't need a Savior. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And my friend, if you die lost without Christ for all eternity, you will be saying to yourself, I really did need a Savior and it will be too late you need to come to Christ now Why he's speaking to your heart I know the Holy Spirit is speaking to you God will accomplish his purpose and his will as his word goes out and it will not return void and the Spirit of God is tugging at your heart today telling you you need a Savior you have a need you say oh I don't have a need I have everything no you don't because what is it going to profit you, sir, man, if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? What shall you give in exchange for your soul today? Christ wants to give you life, everlasting, eternal life. If you're willing to come to Him and give your life over to Him and come in true repentance, turning from your sin, and turning to Christ in faith, believing in Him, and He is more than willing to forgive and to cleanse you and to wash you, to give you and provide for you eternal life, everlasting life. Oh, my friend, how sad it would be to die today lost without Christ when you have an opportunity right now to come to Jesus. 
The Bible says, Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart. Oh, my friend, you need a Savior. Matter of fact, you need a Savior more than you need anything else. And by the way, Christian, you're not living for God. You need to get right with God. And by the way, you need Him more than anything in your life, too, to live a victorious life. You need Christ. Let Christ help you today to be an overcomer of the personal need. That lady had a personal need, and she overcame it by putting her faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and exercising her faith with the prophet of God who represented God. Maybe you need to do that today as well. But we're going to help some of you right now that are watching and listening. Our time is up. I hope we still have a few minutes left for the television. I want you to pray with us. God is speaking to you today. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us help you do that. We're going to pray, and these are words communicating with God. But what's going to save you is putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, let us invite you to do so today, right now. Pray with me. Dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. And I confess, God, that I'm a sinner. And I've sinned against you in heaven. And I'm sorry for it. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe in my heart, that's faith, trusting, that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, the Bible. And so right now, by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die. Now I pray this prayer in faith believing in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you.